Well, good morning. Good snowy, icy morning to you. For those of you who are made in this morning, we're glad to see you in the house of the Lord. For those of you tuning in on our live stream, it's good to see you this morning through the internet. Um, we're sad that you can't be with us this morning, but we're glad you're tuning in uh, to hear this worship service and to hear a word from God this morning. Would you stand and join me in singing hymn 668, Doxology. So welcome you this morning. I think what we see today is we see who lives near the roads that are cleared the quickest, and we also see who likes to live on the edge. And uh, so I saw some of those roads that you drove down today to get here, and I'm glad you made it. But uh, but we welcome you today, and uh, those that are tuning in with the live stream, we hope that. You'll be able to worship with us. Uh, our two bank presidents said to let you know that uh, there's a link there. It's called uh, Online Giving, and we would love for you to participate in the worship service at that point. And, uh, and anyway, but we're glad that you're here. Uh, glad for those that we have the capability that you can tune in on a day like today. And I know we've got some of our folks that are off in sunny warm Florida today and some are in sunny Alabama and uh, hopefully uh, they're having a good time enjoying uh, the nice temperatures but anyway I just want to welcome you today I also want to say thanks to some folks uh, I got up here this morning uh, fairly early checking things out and there's Brandon up here uh, helping clean things I think y'all were here about 5 30 this morning uh, he and Tony O'Banion and they've done a great job just getting things uh, uh, fairly decent for us to be able to be here and, and be a part of this, uh, have service today. And I uh, also want to say thanks to the Humphreys. Uh, they helped out Friday night. Uh, we had a great time uh, with our bowling alley. I think we ended up with about 25 total, 23, 25. Uh, about 20, 20 total. 20 total. So we had a great time. And, uh, and so the kids enjoyed it, and I appreciate their supervision. Thanks, Chuck, for coming and driving the van. But uh, we had a, had a good outing, and uh, uh, so it was a great time. Now, my voice, you know, I've been praying that for a long time that God would bless me with an Adrian Rogers type of voice. And, uh, and this is as far as my prayer got. So I'm sorry. I feel great. Uh, I've been trying to get it cleared up, but I feel good. And... Uh, but I'm glad to be able to be here today, and uh, just bear with me. I'm sorry that my voice uh, sounds a little worse than it normally does. But anyway, we're glad you're in the house of the Lord today. <clears throat> As we pause to pray, uh, let me ask you to be praying for uh, Tim Markham and Beverly and Ashton and their family. Uh, Tim's father, Glenn, uh, passed away uh, on, I think it was Thursday, uh, but uh, we need to be in prayer for them. Uh, the services for Mr. Glenn will be Tuesday, uh, visitation from 10 to 12, and then the service at 12 o'clock. Uh, it will be held at the Sperlin Funeral Home in Lancaster. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, keep them uh, in your thoughts and prayer uh, while they are, are going through this time. And we're going to pray for them at, the, at this time as we pause to go to the Lord today. Would you join me this morning as we pause and pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of the conditions of our roads and, and, uh, and trying to get to church today, we thank you, Lord, that there's a sweet spirit here among us as we desire to worship you, Lord. 
We thank you for providing us a place like this. But Father, we thank you also for uh, the means and technology that allow us to reach out uh, on days like today and for those that are traveling and away from home, uh, that we have the capacity that they can uh, tune in and uh, be a part uh, in, a, in, a, in a small, unique way. And so we pray for those that are listening in today and for each one present that your Holy Spirit uh, would use this time of worship to encourage us in our continued walk with Christ. Lord, we do pray for these that are grieving today. We lift up Tim and Beverly and Ashton and uh, Tim's brother and their family. Lord, just give them the comfort uh, that comes that is that is just, un, uh, I guess, it's hard to explain and, and hard to describe uh, as a child of God comfort that comes uh, in the middle of sorrow. And so, Father, bless them and be with them uh, on this day. Father, we just ask that you will make yourself known in a very special way uh, as we open the Word, as we worship, as we, Lord, listen to what the Spirit uh, is wanting to say to the church. Help us, God, to heed and hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand once again and we're going to sing him 339, Standing on the Promises.
Today's scripture reading comes from John in the 13th chapter, starting in verse 34. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. May God bless the reading of his word.
Amen. <clears throat> if you'll take your Bible this morning and turn with me back to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2 today, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 together. Never be afraid of the book of Revelation. Don't let all the uniqueness of the book, the symbols and signs and numbers uh, cause you to fear uh, studying this book. There's a great blessing promised to those who study the book of Revelation. And if you go into the book with the clear understanding that this book is really about Jesus, that's why it opens up with those wonderful words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of end times. That's not the supreme purpose of it. But it is the revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And we see him in such a unique way in this book. And one thing that we notice about Jesus is that he reminds us in chapters 2 and 3 that he is the Lord of the church. He is the one that oversees the church. He is the one that is looking in, who is observing the church. And chapters 2 and 3 really... Uh, point that out and I think cause us to have a moment of uh, pause when we realize that the church belongs to him and he knows everything that is going on. He sees everything we do. He's interested in all that we do, all that we believe, all that we stand for. He takes note of it. And as he approaches these seven churches, he gives them some similar words of advice, but in each one, he also points out a matter that, that he is concerned over. Five of the seven churches receive a word of correction. Only two did not receive the word of correction. As we look at these seven churches, we recognize that Though they were historical churches and they existed in the time frame that they're written to, they also represent the church today. As we look at these seven churches, we'll notice and, and we will see some similarities to our own church. As he points out the things that he commended them, we'll realize, you know, I can see our church. I, I recognize our church there. But then as he points out the things that had to be corrected, I think if we're honest, we will look in the mirror as a church and would have to say that we too are guilty. But the wonderful thing about each church that he deals with is that he gives steps to correction. He doesn't just leave the church in the condition that he finds them in. He provides a way of change. Now, as we look at these seven churches, let's also realize that they can represent our Christian life. You know, we need moments of examination. We need those moments that we can pause and really examine our spiritual journey, our spiritual maturity. How well are we doing in our growth with Christ? Are we moving forward? <laughs> Or have we become complacent? Has Christian life become somewhat stale? And, and it's lost its zeal and, as we would say, that, that vibrant nature that our relationship with Christ ought to have? So this is a moment of examination as we look at these churches. Now, he begins with the church in Ephesus that's found in chapter 2. And verse 1, and notice the opening words to his letter, to his word to the church at Ephesus. He says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Now the word angel is a word that means messenger. And so Jesus is giving a word to the messenger of the church at Ephesus. Now, the first thing that I notice in that is the very holy and heavy responsibility of the messenger, of the pastor. <clears throat> In verse 2, he clarifies again who he's writing to. He says, these things says he who holds the seven stars 
in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now here he uses the word stars, and that also represents the messenger. So in a way, the pastor is called an angel and a star. <laughs> now I don't believe many of us pastors live up to that particular designation, <clears throat> but we recognize the the, the holy responsibility of leaders of the church, that we are held accountable. I think James says, be careful wanting to be a teacher in the church because we will be held to a higher standard. We will be held uh, before the Lord with uh, greater consequences because of that position that we are carrying out, that we hold. So he's writing to the church, he's writing to the messengers, the pastor, but he includes the fact of the church when he says he walks in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. Now that represents the church body. So that means that Jesus is familiar with what we're doing here at First Baptist Owenton. He's aware of this local church, he's planted us here, this church has been here for a long time, and Christ is aware of all that we do. He comes in and he examines what we're doing, and I think at times he gives us a commendation, and then at times he has to give a word of correction. And as we look at the church of Ephesus, we realize that the church of Ephesus was uh, basically the mother church of all the other churches that are going to be dealt with. This was that mother church that was helpful in the establishment of the six other churches. So Ephesus was a great church. It was a church planting church. It was a church that sent folks out, and they were uh, carrying the gospel out in, in all in many places, and other churches were being birthed through this mother church. We know that Ephesus was introduced to the gospel by a husband and wife. Over in the book of Acts, chapter 18, it describes for us that Aquila and his wife Priscilla introduced the gospel to Ephesus and they were a vital part in the beginnings of this church. So it started with lay people. Uh, it started with Aquila and Priscilla and then Acts 24 says that another man came along that was influential. His name was Apollos. Apollos was a very eloquent preacher and speaker. I would say that he had the Adrian Rogers kind of voice, you know, if you know what I mean. I mean, he was a powerful uh, speaker and preacher, and, and these three were very influential in presenting the gospel and helping the church to start. Now, Paul, Paul didn't really come along and have much of an emphasis until his third missionary journey as he was traveling. And when he did get to Ephesus, we know that he stayed there for about three years. Uh, that was a long time for Paul to be in one place. So what we're seeing is that Ephesus had a great beginning, a solid foundation influenced by very wise and godly uh, leaders from Aquila <coughs> and Priscilla and <coughs> excuse me, Apollos and Paul. And then we find out that Timothy, Timothy was a pastor uh, at the church of of Ephesus and then later John the writer of Revelation spent a great deal of time uh, there and it was there that he wrote the book of first John and second John and third John and probably from here was exiled to the island of Patmos so what a history we would say you know we look at our church we know we have a great history uh, studying the history of First Baptist Owenton is, is, is fun. It's interesting. Uh, I, I take pride in saying that this church was pastored by the, uh, by the first leader of the Southern Baptist Sunday School Board. That man that was used in a great way in our convention life had roots here at First Baptist Owenton. That's something to, to enjoy. And, and now we have the joy of saying that we are also a church where our president, present, president of the International Mission Board uh, put roots down here and affected a lot of lives, Dr. Paul Chitwood. And so we can look back at the deep, rich heritage of First Baptist Owenton. I know many of you have 
pastors in your heart that were very meaningful to you in the past uh, as we think of uh, them in the respect that they may have married you or they baptized you or they led you to Christ. And uh, I've talked to some of our older members, like a pastor, I think his name was uh, Brother Green, uh, who had a very instrumental place in the life of our church. Uh, we think about uh, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Jim, who uh, had such an impact in our church and, and represented us on the mission field as a missionary uh, in the Middle East. And, and on and on we could go with thinking about each of these men and the ministry they've had in this church. Well, Ephesus was much like that. But Ephesus was in a very challenging area. Ephesus was a city of 300 to 500,000 in population. So we're talking about a, a, a very large place that God planted this church to have an impact upon the lostness that existed in that area. <coughs> Ephesus was known as a, as a great city during that time. It was a very influential city in the province of Asia. Uh, it was known for its trade. It was known for its great harbor. It was known for its tremendous, uh, the, the tremendous roads that they had uh, in that area. But it was also known uh, for its religious worship. It was here in Ephesus that the great, one of the great wonders of the world exists. One of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, it was here that the temple to <coughs> Artemis was erected. And uh, we would say the temple of Diana uh, was located in Ephesus. And you can imagine the impact that that temple had upon the economy. Uh, many writers said that the pagan craftsman business uh, was thriving in that area because of the worship of Diana. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll know that because of the influence of that church in Ephesus, that a, that a great riot broke out. Uh, one of the silversmiths, whose livelihood depended upon the selling of things related to the worship of Diana, a man by the name of <coughs> Demetrius, uh, caused a riot. Uh, to break out in the city. Uh, I am sure that he did not like the way the gospel was spreading because Acts describes that so many of those that were involved in, in magic and, and, uh, and those type of things began coming to Christ. Uh, they were being saved. And, and it was such a large influence that all of these who were involved in that type of uh, perversion it says they brought their books, they brought their instruments, they brought their material that they used in that particular type of practice. And when they brought it all together, the scripture said that, that it was equal. The, the amount of money that all of that would have equaled uh, would be basically <coughs> 15 years of wages for one person. Imagine that happening in our area. Imagine that uh, businesses were closing because so many are being saved that it's beginning to affect all the businesses. Uh, imagine <clears throat> that if the Lord so moved, and, and you know, I'm, I was thinking this morning that today, today is a day that in our country's history is a tragic day on, on the calendar of our nation's history because it was on this day in 1973, 46 years ago, that the Supreme Court approved and voted to legalize abortion. And, and you know, folks, we think about that by, by this point, we're looking at in the realm of 50 to 60 million babies have been aborted in our country. Uh, you say, how can that be? Well, part of it is the economics of it. Uh, people have become wealthy over that practice. But imagine in our nation that an awakening took place that so moved that, that the abortion industry came to a climactic end. Imagine that so many are being saved that the alcohol industry came to an end because there's no 
no one seeking it because they have found life in Christ. Uh, imagine that lives are being so changed that the gambling industry was shut down, that no one's buying the lottery tickets anymore. Nobody's betting on the horses anymore. You think that there would be a sense of rioting in the streets of Kentucky and in the streets of our nation if things like that happened? I mean, we know it would. Uh, there would be a great uh, riot or be a great desire to try to demean the gospel and, the, and what is happening. Well, that was the framework of the church in Ephesus. And this church was making an impact and it was changing lives to such an extent that there was this pushback by those who made great money uh, over those particular things. So here is the backdrop of this church, the location, uh, what the church was facing. And then to this church, Jesus, who is described in verse 2, when it says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who is walking in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. Now that describes Christ. So this is Jesus' words. Uh, this isn't the preacher John just coming up with some thoughts and ideas. This is the word of our Lord. And he says to that church in Ephesus in that time frame, facing what it was facing and going through what it was going through, he says to them, I know your works. Now that word know is a word that means uh, I have complete and full knowledge of what is going on there at that church. It's not a word that means he was growing in his understanding of what the church was doing. It is a word that means he knew full well everything that was going on. And that's why as a church, we would do well to always be open and honest and upfront and never ever try to conceal because you can't conceal anything from the eyes of our Lord. He knows everything that we do. He knows the motivation of why we do it. He sees everything that goes on in his local church. Not only that, he sees everything that goes on in my life. <laughs> he sees when I try to hide my sin. <laughs> and I think if God was to have a humorous moment, I think it's many times when he watches us as his children, trying to conceal something, trying to hide it, trying to cover it up. Just like in your grow, raising children, and you know, you know that they're lying to you, and you know the truth, and you just sit back in amazement to the level that they will go to try to wiggle their way out of a situation. And you, you just know it. And I think sometimes God the Father looks at us and says, I, I just cannot believe how my children think they can wiggle their way out or they can conceal or hide something when I know all things. Well, Jesus is saying to the church, I know, I know your works. I have full knowledge. And he says to them, first of all, I know your works. That word means I know your deeds. So he begins as he approaches this, this church in Ephesus. And he gives them some words of encouragement. In a way, it's like he is like a, like a parent standing on the sidelines when their child is out there giving it their best. And the child or the parent is saying, you're doing well. Hang in there. Keep it up. Keep it up. Finish well. And that's what Christ does for the church. He doesn't begin by condemning the church. He begins by commending the church. And he says, I know your works. I know your deeds. I know that you are active and you are energetic in what you're doing for me. But then he says, I know your labor. And that word in verse 2, labor, means it's a word that means I know not only your works, the deeds that you're doing, but I know the level of the works that you're doing. I know how you are laboring in what you do. It's a word that means to be wholesome. It's a word that speaks of giving it your all, all out Effort. Now, what does that speak of? He says, I know, Ephesus, that you are doing what you are doing at a cost. 
and you are willing to pay a high cost to honor me and to serve me. He was saying to them, I'm proud of you that you're not a spectator, but you are a participator. They were aggressive in evangelism. They were aggressive in edifying one another in the word. They were involved in compassionate care for each other. And he's saying to them, I'm proud of you. And I believe that Jesus would say that about First Baptist Orton. So many in this body that labor and toil and are willing to do it even at a cost. A cost that sometimes your family, don't, they do not support what you believe and, and what you do. Your friends, maybe your co-workers, they don't understand why you have uh, such a faithful connection to Jesus the way you do. And Jesus would say to you, I commend you and I congratulate you. But then he says this, he says, I know also your patience. Now that's a word that we all realize it can be struggling. And sometimes we think of patience as, as just grinding it out and gritting our teeth and, and just kind of holding our words back. But that's not what the word here means at all. This word for patient means to have courage and to accept the hardships that you're going through. It's a word that means to suffer loss. And, and he was saying to the church, despite the pain and the suffering that you have had to endure, you have remained faithful in the middle of it. And he said, I want to con commend you for your patience. I commend you for remaining faithful when others have quit. I don't know what the Lord ended up leading Ross to speak on Wednesday night, but I had told him, I said, go in there and just talk to these kids about how you can stay faithful to Jesus when a lot of your friends don't. Because Ross is a young man that has been faithful to the Lord through high school uh, when a lot of his friends were doing things and going places and involved in matters uh, that they shouldn't have been. And I'm not saying that Ross is perfect and he would stand up and acknowledge that. But I tell you, he's been faithful. And that's what this word is speaking of. It means being faithful when you're all alone. Being faithful when, when you're not getting support from your peers or even your parents. That Jesus said, I commend the church for having that kind of courage when it was hard. And then he says something else to him. Notice this. It's very interesting in verse 2. And he says, I know that you cannot bear those who are evil. He says to them, I know that you are not tolerant of evil men. That word evil means good for nothing. You mean to tell me Jesus agrees with hatred? He sure does. He makes it clear. He says, I know that you cannot bear those who are evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. He says, I, I know you can't bear that. You hate that. On verse, if you want to jump over with me real quick, I want you to notice what he says about another matter. In verse 6, he says, but you also have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. You realize there's things that God hates? There's things Jesus hates? And there's two of them mentioned right here to this church. He says, I know that you cannot handle, you do not put up with, you do not condone those who are evil men who, who have been found as they've been tested and they have come up short. I want to tell you, Jesus commends when we hate the deeds of evil men. He makes it clear he's not saying he hated men. He doesn't hate the evil men. But Christ hates the deeds of evil teachers and evil men. He was saying to the church of Ephesus, I commend you for holding up a standard that is high and holy. I commend you for the practice of church discipline. When, when Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he reminds them that we are in a spiritual battle and that we should uh, hold the standard high 
and we should not allow sin to go unchecked in the local assembly. And that meant church discipline. Now, that doesn't mean, folks, I remember one older member of a church when his pastor was trying to talk about church discipline, he said, preacher, you mean to tell me that when these kids are around you, we're supposed to give them a spanking? He said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. Church discipline is when the church realizes that it's held accountable to a holy God. And when there is sin in the family, we don't turn a blind eye and we don't turn our back and we don't put our head in the sand. But we lovingly approach and we lovingly point out and we lovingly try to restore that brother or sister to a place where the Lord wants them to be. And Ephesus practiced that. You want to talk about something that is a practice that we are scared to death of, that is the practice that in the local church today, that I want to tell you, it, it would be like teaching a foreign language for most churches if we started teaching and practicing that particular matter. Because we'd be too scared. Oh, Brother Brad, do you realize if you do that, and if the church practiced that, it, it's going to divide the church. Uh, it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, it's going to hurt some of the uh, outstand, upstanding members of our church. It might include one of their family members. But Ephesus was not afraid to do what they knew was right. And he says to them, I commend you for not tolerating those who are evil men, who were teaching evil things, who were practicing evil practices. You confronted, you uh, sought to uh, point out, and he commends them for it. And then he says, I also commend you that you practice testing those who say they are one thing and they're not. He says, you have also tested those who say they are apostles and they're not apostles. And you have found them to be liars. He says, I want to commend you that you've tested those who claim to be called of God, but they did not meet the criteria. You know what I found? Satan's greatest weapon in the church is not the woodpeckers on the outside, it's the temp termites on the inside. It's the false teaching that goes on many times through those that try to come in as wolves in sheep clothing. And Ephesus made a point to test carefully those who were put in positions of authority and those who were put in positions of teaching the Word of God. They took that as a very serious matter. And I pray that our church will be cautious that we'll never be guilty of putting people in positions thinking that will help them to grow or mature or to be more faithful because that is an unwise direction to go in a local church. And he commends them for not doing that. But in the midst of all of this great uh, and encouraging word, he also says to them, I have a complaint. We have the great commendation, we have the great uh, congratulation words, but then he has, to, he has to be honest and look at what he says in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have something against you, that you have left your first love. What I find at Ephesus is that it was a church that valued ritual more than relationship. It was a church that was more involved in, in the duties of the Christian life rather than the, the delight of the Christian life. It was a church that had, had basically become a working, commendable church, but it was a loveless church. It had replaced its relationship with Christ with ritual for Christ. And he uses a distinct word. He says, you have left your first love. That means to depart you have neglected, you have forsaken your first love. That word for love is agape love. It means a God kind of love. He said you have become blinded to your neglect of a relationship with me. When we think about first love, that is a phrase that means that, that love of holding Jesus to the highest level of affection and abiding in that love which leads us to engaging in activities that that love gives us impulses to do. It's a reminder that when it comes to our walk with Christ as individual Christians and our relationship with Christ as a church, that the supreme characteristic of a Christian and the supreme characteristic of a church is not our activity or duty to Christ, but our affection 
and relationship with Christ. That's what he's saying to the church. All of these things you've done for me are good, but you've neglected the best. You've forgotten that the motivation of what you do should stem from your overwhelming love relationship with me. Let me quickly, and I promise we're going to wrap it up quickly. I know we're about out of time, but I want to, I want to point out a couple of things. Hold your place there. Jump, jump to Matthew real quick. We're going to read through some things really quickly to remind ourselves of how important this supreme kind of love is for the Christian life. Matthew 22, look at, look at, listen to these words. Jesus said to him, man asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, real quickly. Matthew 10, verse 37. Listen to these words. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He is not saying we hate our family, but he's saying my love, your love for me ought to surpass your love for anything else. In John chapter 14, quickly as we move through the gospel, John chapter 14, verse 21, listen to what Christ says, reminding us and reminding the church of the importance of our love relationship. Matthew, uh, John 14, verse 21. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 21 and 23. It says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then verse 28, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. John chapter 8, verse 42. Listen to what the Scripture says. Jesus talking. John 8, 42. The Scripture says, <clears throat> Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me me. And then I want you to look with me real quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. Listen to the words of Paul. If anyone loves God, this one is known of him. If anyone loves God, they are known by God. 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 16, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. Listen to what the Bible says. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come 2 Corinthians chapter 5, last one, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, listen to this. For the love of Christ is what compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. You get it? He is saying to the church of Ephesus, I, I, I commend you for what you're doing, but listen, you're losing out. You're forgetting the most important thing is your relationship with me, loving me with all your heart. Church, do we love Jesus with all of our heart? Is he, the, is he the motivation for everything we do for him? Because if it's not all of these things we do for him, it loses it. it, loses it. You will start drifting, believe it or not. You can, be, you can be so busy in church work, and when you lose that first love relationship, you, you, are, you can say, man, I am so busy for God. But your busyness is really just a cover-up that you really are far from God. Isn't it amazing? We think, man, I'm, I'm really serving God, and I'm just doing all this, doing all this, and we can be doing all these things. And if we've neglected that, we're not getting closer to God. We are drifting further away. Man, you can do a lot of good things for God and be out of the will of God and out of fellowship with God. And that's what he's saying to the church of Ephesus. Fix this. And that's how he, he closes with them when he says in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Folks, this was 40 years later that Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus. It was 40 years since it was started by 
uh, Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos and, and Timothy's influence and Paul's influence and, and, and John's influence. Forty years later, he is saying to them, you're still doing all of these things properly and honorably, but you've lost your relationship with me. You don't love me the way you used to. Do you remember when Jesus set Peter down on that shore? And he was about to depart from the heaven, and he wanted to put pinpoint Peter and, and, and discern what his spiritual condition was. Do you remember how he discerned it? He didn't go to Peter and say, now what have you been doing for me lately? He said, Peter, do you love me? And he, he asked him three times because that was really the key of whether or not his spiritual condition was right. And Jesus is asking First Baptist the one to the same question. Do you love me? Do you love me? He's asking us as individual Christians, do you love me? And if you have to say, Jesus, I've left my first lot. What do I do? He says, one, remember. Remember, remember where you left it. You know, the danger of a Christian is when we don't remember, when we forget. I have heard stories. I have dealt with individuals who have gone shipwrecked in their faith. They've drifted from God. And I tell you, folks, it is amazing how many times I hear this phrase from those individuals, here's what I hear so often. I hear these words. What was I thinking? That's why Jesus said, you got to think. That's the problem. When we get shipwrecked in our faith, we're not thinking. He says, remember where you left it. Number two, repent. Repent of it. You see, failing to love God is sin. It's not just a bad thing. Failing to love God the way he describes is sin. So he says, repent, repent of it. That's it's a simple statement. Just go to God and say, God, I, I'm honest with you. I do not love you the way I used to. I have left my first love, but right now I repent of it. I have tried to replace my love for you by the things I do for you. And right now, I acknowledge and repent of it. And then he says, what does he say? He says, renew. Renew the first works. Renew them. <laughs> Just start again. Start loving me. Fall in love with me. Just love me, and then I'll show you what to do. And he gives them an or else. <laughs> or else. You know what or else means? It means you either do it or, or I'm going to take your witness away. Let me tell you something that's sad, folks. As great as Ephesus was, it did not repent. As great a church as that was, it was a mother church to all these other churches. It was a church that was exemplary in so many ways. But history records that Ephesus did not repent. They did not heed the counsel of Jesus, and therefore they became another forgotten testimony. God doesn't make an exception no matter how busy we are, no matter how good we are. Because when we don't love him with all of our heart, we are far, far, far from him. And he says, I will come, in verse 7, and will remove your lampstand. doesn't mean they lost their salvation. It means they lost their witness. They became dry and stale. And, and you know, the sad thing about it is there's a lot of churches like Ephesus that are among us that are still doing great things for God, but God left them a long time ago. The Spirit of God left. And he wrote over that door of that, those churches, Ichabod, the glory has departed and they are still as busy as all get out. But Jesus has said, you didn't heed my word. Now Christian, let's be honest today to look in the mirror and say, God, as you look at me, as you see what's there, if he shows you that you've left your first love, you would do well today to take some time and do those things. Remember where you left it. Repent and see it as sin. And say, God, renew within me again a deep, genuine, passionate love for you because I know that is the greatest commandment. That is the greatest thing. That is the greatest activity that I can be a part of. So today our invitation is to realize that doing Right things 
does not make up for a cold heart. We need a heart that is in love with Jesus. I'm going to close our service with reading two other verses, and then this will be our invitation time. But I want to close with, with these reminders. In the book of Proverbs, listen to what the wise words of the writer of Proverbs says to us as we hear very clearly in Proverbs chapter 4. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse uh, 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Listen to these words and let's heed them. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And then one other final word as we come to our invitation. In the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 14. I want you to hear the words that I think apply uh, to us as we come to the conclusion of our time here in God's word. Hosea chapter 14 and verse 1. Listen to these words and let them be a a warning wake-up call in verse 1. It says this, O Israel, you might want to put your name there, O Brad, or O First Baptist Church, Bowenton, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously. For we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods. For in you the fatherless find mercy. And if we do that, folks, if we'll, if we'll pray that prayer for ourselves and for our church, listen to what God says in return in verse 4. I will heal I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from, from him. God will do that for us. He'll do it for you. This morning, if you're here and you say, Brother Brad, first thing I need to do is I need to do what those teenagers have done the last two weeks. I need to be saved. I need to yield my life to Christ. I want to give you that opportunity to come right now at this invitation and be saved. Or if you're here and say, Brother Brad, my heart is cold and indifferent. I am busy as a bee, but my relationship with Jesus has grown cold and dull. My heart is far from the Lord. You might just want to come and have a quiet time, personal time with the Lord this morning. Or you might need somebody to pray with you. I will. I know there's others here. We'll, we'll pray with you. But let's, let's take this moment and let's heed the counsel of our Lord that is so clear here. You come as the Lord would lead. Would you stand with me?